This podcast will contain spoilers for all published novellas in the Tales of Duncan Egg series and all published books in the A Song of Ice and Fire series, as well as HBO's Game of Thrones. Welcome to the Vassals of Kingsgrave. Today we'll be discussing The Hedge Knight, the first of the Tales of Duncan Egg series of novellas written by George R.R. R. Martin as adjacent stories to his Song of Ice and Fire novels. The stories follow Dunk, a humble hedge knight, and his squire, Egor Aegon, a fourth son to a fourth son in the Targaryen lineage as they make their way across Westeros and bear witness to many of the events that helped shape the world we see in the main story, including the Great Spring Sickness and the Blackfire Rebellions. These events also eventually lead to Egg taking up the mantle as king in Westeros, with Dunk or Sir Duncan the Tall as his Lord Commander of the King's Guard, until they meet their end at the tragedy of Summer Hall. The novellas The Hedge Knight, The Sworn Sword, and The Mystery Knight are available in the Legends, Legends 2, and Warriors anthologies. Graphic novel formats are also available for the first two. Joining me to discuss The Hedge Knight are Bina. Hi everybody, it's Bina007 from the forums. The Krum. Vic. Oh, I'm sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vikram, I go by as 42 on the forums. Lee? Hey everybody, this is Lee, I'm usually Lord Manderbly on the forums. Amanda? Hey, this is Amanda, I normally go by my Middle Cyclone on the forums. Michael? Hi, this is Michael, I go by Mordian on the forums. And Nadia? Hi everyone, this is Nadia from the forums. Awesome. So um, before we get started, I, I prepared a brief, well, not that brief, summary of The Hedge Knight, the story we'll be discussing today, the first, of course, of the three novellas. So with that, here we go. The Hedge Knight opens with Dunk burying Sir Arlen of Pennytree, for whom he squired for many years since the man rescued Dunk from the squalor of Flea Bottom and King's Landing. Dunk, lamenting the old man's loss, but unsure of what he will do next, takes his arms, armor, and horses and makes for the nearby tourney at Ashford Meadow. On the way, he stops at an inn where he unwittingly encounters Daron, or Daron the Drunken, the firstborn of Mako Targaryen, who himself is the fourth son of the reigning king of Westeros, Daron the Second. And uh, if you think this is confusing, you haven't read The Princess and the Queen. Uh, Prince Daron remarks to Dunk that he dreamed of him. Dunk leaves and on his way out encounters Egg for the first time, he himself a son of Makar, masquerading as a stable boy. He asks if he can go to Ashford with Dunk, but Dunk waves him off, sure that the boy will have a better life at a good inn like this. Uh, When he arrives at Ashford, Dunk marvels at the spectacle and the array of lords present to participate in the tourney, including Prince Valar Targaryen, son to the heir apparent, the far-finned Valar Breakspear, Lord Leo Tyrell, Sir Tybal Lannister, Sir Lionel Baratheon, Sir Humphrey Harding, and Sir Stephen Fossaway. Dunk heads into the tourney grounds the next day and goes to watch a puppet show, paying particular attention to the tall, pretty Dornish girl controlling the dragon. Afterward, he goes to search for armor, but learns that he must sell one of the three horses he took from Sir Arlen to afford the price the armorsmith sets. That night, as Dunk makes camp under the bow of an elm tree, he once again encounters Egg, who followed him to Ashford. Dunk, annoyed at first, eventually agrees to take the boy on as his squire, charging him to watch the camp as he sets off to register for the tourney. He visits the steward of Ashford Castle to do just this, but is rebuffed and told that he must find a lord who can prove that he is a knight in truth. As Dunk leaves, he encounters Prince Arion Targaryen, who takes Dunk for a stable boy and insults him. Dunk then sells his mare Sweetfoot to afford the price of the armor and goes to watch another puppet show. Afterward, he plucks up the courage to ask the pretty puppeteer if she'll join him for ale and sausage, but she declines. Dunk wanders off and meets Sir Stephen Fossaway and his squire Raymond Fossaway as they train on foot, the older Fossaway easily besting his cousin. Raymond urges Dunk to fight his cocky cousin, but Dunk is eager to acquire his armor and relieve himself of his heavy purse. The next day, Dunk goes to Sir Manfred Dondarrion, whose father Sir Arlen rode with three years back, but Manfred does not recognize him and refuses to help. Dunk wanders back to Ashford Castle, thoroughly dejected, in search of the steward and is directed to the Great Hall. There he encounters Lord Ashford, Valor Breakspear, the Hand of the King, and his brother Makar. Valor vouches for Dunk, recalling that he once broke four lances against Sir Arlen uh, at Storm's End a few years back. Dunk realizes that he is speaking to the Prince of Dragonstone, heir apparent to the Iron Throne, and is told that he must find a new sigil for himself. He returns to the young puppeteer, finding Egg there watching another show. He asks the girl if she'll paint him a sigil, which they agree to be a green shooting star above an elm tree proper on sunset. The tourney begins the next day, and an array of lordly knights ride forth to unhorse the five champions tasked with defending the Queen of Love and Beauty. At the day's end, Sir Tybal, Prince Valor Targaryen, son of Baelor, Lord Leo Tyrell, Sir Lionel Baratheon, and Sir Humphrey Harding, who splintered no less than twelve lances against Sir Humphrey Beesbury, a bout that came to be known among the small folk as the Battle of Humphrey, and considered the best of the day. 
Dunk is thoroughly impressed by the spectacle, but the day is marred when Prince Arion is in a show of great dishonor, drives his lance through Sir Humphrey Harding, Harding's horse, killing the animal and crushing one of the knight's legs. That evening, Dunk discusses the unfortunate event with Raymond Fossaway, pleased at least that Sir Humphrey Harding will be allowed to stay as an honorary champion for the duration of the tourney despite his injury. As they converse, Egg bursts into the Fossaway tent and, and tells Dunk that Arion is hurting the young puppeteer. Dunk rushes to the scene and attacks Arion, who breaks one of the puppeteer's fingers for the treachery of putting on a show where the dragon loses. Dunk punches Arion, but is pulled away by the prince's men-at-arms. Dunk is jailed in a tower cell and is brought up on trial for assaulting a royal prince. Darion, who had charge of Aegon before he went missing, says that he too has a grievance with the brigand knight. Dunk requests a trial of combat, as is his right, but Arion demands a trial of seven. Dunk scrambles madly to find six fellows to join him in a battle against two princes and three members of the king's guard. Sir Stephen Fossaway and Egg promise to find him loyal men. Prince Darion speaks to Dunk and saying that he wishes things could have been, not been this way and tells D Dunk of his plan to fall immediately when the battle begins. Dunk goes to find the puppeteers to retrieve the shield but finds that they are gone. The armorsmith's steely pate calls him over and says that he, they left the painted shield behind with him, offering it to him for a paltry sum. Dunk heads off for the tourney grounds where he is met by the men Egg has gathered, specifically Sir Humphrey Harding, Sir Humphrey Beesbury, Sir Robin Risling, and Sir Lionel Baratheon. Sir Raymond is hastily knighted by Sir Lionel to make six, but when Sir Stefan arrives, he announces that he will be fighting for Prince Arian instead. Dunk, at a loss for what he will do, watches in wonder as Prince Baylor rides up in his son's armor to join Dunk against the accusers. The bout begins, and the knights come together in a clash. Dunk makes for Prince Arian, who crashes into Dunk and unhorses him. He very nearly crushes Dunk with his morning star, but the hedge knight rolls free and pulls the prince to the ground, forcing him to yield. The battle ends just like that, but not before Baylor is fatally wounded by none other than his brother Makar. The next day, Dunk, fearing for his life, is retrieved by a group of Targaryen men-at-arms. Sure that he is about to be executed, Dunk is surprised to learn that Prince Makar wishes for Dunk to come to his castle, Summerhall, and be trained as a knight in truth, with Egg as his squire. Dunk agrees to keep Aegon with him, but says that it will, it will be better for the boy if he maintains his life as a hedge knight, swearing oath, oath to whatever lord will take him. As the story continues, Dunk muses that Dorne might be a good destination, and Egg remarks that he's heard that they have good puppet shows there. And that is that. Um, so to begin, guys, I thought it might be good to just give our lemon cake ratings on this story, The Hedge Knight, and maybe if you have an interesting story of how you discovered the, st the stories, the novellas, and how you got them, then that too. So uh, I'll start with you, Bina. Um, I give them a solid five out of five. I really enjoyed all of the Dunk Knight tales, and I think Mimi is totally right that in retrospect they'll be seen as an important part of the canon um, on a par with main novels. I don't really have an interesting story of how I came to them, um, although I did buy the actual books. I didn't go read them in a bookstore. Yeah. No, I love the characters. I love the camaraderie. And in a world that's so cynical and dark in the main novels, it's just so nice to see these two guys who are basically just good mates. How about you, Vic? Oh, yeah. I really like the enjoyed the story a lot. I would give it five out of five. And I think it's probably the best of all the three stories probably even better than Princess and the Queen also. Um, as far as how I procured them, I choose to not to incriminate, incriminate myself, so I plead the fifth. Uh, but although I have to say, I later on bought the Warrior anthology with George Martin's signature on it, so I hope that compensates. <laughs> um, yeah, they're kind of inconvenient how to get it, you know. I, we were just talking with Brett yesterday, White Raven on the forums, and he hasn't read them because it's it's a, it's hard to get, get your hands on it. Just, yeah. the, just the stories itself. Otherwise, you have to run around buy three different books and all so it's very inconvenient but yeah i think uh, the perspective it's from the ground grounder point of view like i think we we discuss this often right like there's no a commoner's point of view in uh, songs of ice and fire except for davos maybe if you consider him a commoner uh so it's refreshing it's a different view of the world Right, and I plan to go more into the whole perspective of the small folk in Westeros and uh, the meaning and the import of that and the series in general, of course. And I definitely agree that uh, it stinks that there's no way to get all these, these stories in one thing, and hopefully we do get that complete uh, grouping of them in some kind of published book at some point. Uh, so how about you, Lee? I never thought they were that hard to find. Um, I don't know. I read them all in the short story collections they came out in. So I, or I read Hedge Knight in Dream Songs. And I oh, right. Dream Songs, right. right. Uh, Sworn Sword there. and Mystery Knight in Legends and Warriors, which all the other stories in which are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> really? Just, I liked some of them. Maybe I liked, like, one of them. I don't know. Yeah. I read them a while ago, but I was, they were certainly not Hedge Knight quality. Uh, no, no. Um, you know what's really cool? I never even bother reading any of the other stories to know, which is awful, because I guess it's a way of George R. R. Martin 
getting attention for other authors, but I don't even bother. No, a lot of those authors are, are were at the time as well known as he was. Yeah. Yeah, um, certainly I, for the legends, yeah. Yeah. Um, his other short story collections I usually enjoy more, but these are just really like low quality. But that's not the point. Um, and you can buy them as graphic novels now, I think. You can. Yep. Not for not for their mystery night, but the other two you can, yes. No, and yeah. so my rating, I don't know, I'd give it a pretty high rating. I really love them. Um, I'd give it like a four and a half. I'd give Hedge Knight a four and a half. Sworn Sword a three, probably. <laughs> um, no, three and a half. And it's uh, Venice, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> and Mystery Night like a four and a half. Okay, so how about you, Amanda? Well, I actually read them as the graphic novels first. I hadn't read them as the main, as the actual short stories until very recently through similar methods to what Vikram was applying, uh, implying. Um, but I would definitely give it a four out of five of Lemon Cakes. I really love the story, and I think it's it's just a very different perspective, and it's a different way of, like, the way George is telling the story is very different from how he usually tells individual points of view so i really enjoy it it's very like fresh and different for him i think awesome yeah i hope to get the graphic novels at some point i just they sound really cool I just the art's it. cool it's yeah. it's like worth looking at actually don't get the game of thrones graphic novels though <laughs> <laughs> duly noted uh how about you Michael? Yeah. <laughs> um i really like them a lot i'd say uh the first one here is, is probably my favorite i'd say probably five out of five and then dropping slightly into the four range with the with the second and then back up to maybe four and a half for the mystery night um i didn't acquire them in any particularly interesting way i think i i didn't want to pay out for the uh for the anthologies and i didn't want to read them in graphic novel form so i just put them on a christmas list and somebody bought them (laughs) it's efficient yeah (laughs) and nadia Hedge night i probably give five and swans would be much less, I think a three and a half. And then the mystery night again, four and a half. Um, and as to how I got the stories, I would rather not say. <laughs> okay. Uh, awesome. Yeah. I also um, just bought the short story anthologies after uh, learning about them. I just, at the time, I was just so very into everything A Song of Ice and Fire and wanted to consume everything humanly possible. So I. I just dropped the money and I tried to read a few of the other short stories and and failed. I I did finish a couple, but I I realized in the end I was just in for the Dunkin' Egg. But I I would say it was well worth it. Uh, I would give The Hedge Knight 5 out of 5. I seriously love this story. I kind of have just a a resonant appreciation for these sort of knight stories with tourneys and and all of that classic stuff that we don't often get to see in... um, the A Song of Ice and Fire novels proper, especially lately. Uh, it seems like we've kind of departed from some of that that kind of stuff in favor of uh, more intrigue and, and dark brooding and all that. But that's fun stuff, too. Um, uh, yeah, nothing too interesting for me as to how I got them. I just kind of bought them in a row on uh, digitally. Uh, so I thought we'd begin with the um, a discussion on the small folk in Westeros and how important this perspective and this this, th- this theme is to the story in general and what we just think about it in general. Uh, especially because lately it seems like on the forums people have been discussing the idea that that um, trying to figure out the morality of various lords like Kevin Lannister and Tywin Lannister and whether or not their actions against the small folk uh, damn them as characters and a lot of the argument has been that the small folk are just not important as characters. And I think that the Hedge Knight brings an interesting perspective uh, in giving us this insight to basically uh, any old small, small folk in Dunk. He was born in Flea Bottom, was raised as a squire, but a Hedge Knight squire. And there's some dubious um, evaluation of whether or not he was made a knight or if even Sir Arlen Pennytree was a true uh, Hedge Knight himself. So uh, anyone would just want to give thoughts on that idea generally and we can move into more specific topics? I think uh, in in real world the the knights would have behaved more like they behave in hedge knight than than like Arthurian st- kind of style, right? I mean, in a way, all these knights are all thugs, and all the all the lords and uh, dukes and earls are all basically mafia bosses kind of thing. They, I mean, that's that's what I picture. A, a mafia boss is probably a, a modern day version of a lord or a thing, and. And I, yeah, so that's what I feel like. So, so I, I don't think there ever was in real world history ever was a true upstanding knight kind of character. They were all like, like that, you know, douchey and stuff. I mean, as a, as a rule, I think you're probably right. But I, I mean, the idea that there's never been anyone who was, uh, 
you know, serious about being a knight seems unlikely. Yeah, I, I, I obviously history is hard to um, say exactly how things went, but I, I always had the sense that actual knighthood was a little bit more of a big deal than we see in these stories. It seems like it's very odd that you can just knight someone at just because you're a knight. I felt like that there was more of a process and ceremony and and work behind doing something like that. I didn't think that it was always um, so bad like this, but maybe this is a a decay. It didn't used to be like this in Westeros, but it has just gotten to this point where people are less concerned with these kind of things. I don't know. I kind of think that the the Westerosi uh, any knight can make a knight thing is is probably a good ultim- uh, more than a bad. I mean, otherwise it sort of uh, consolidates thing. If say only lords could make a knight or something, then it just sort of consolidates uh, all sort of power and responsibility even more. Whereas when you have this any knight can make a knight situation, uh, I think that uh, less well well-born or well-known people actually have a chance to i mean it's a very small amount of social mobility but uh it's at least a little bit of it knights yeah. are also there's also a lot of religious uh, aspect to it also right like uh yeah like usually the knighting ceremony is done in a sept or something and it's mostly seen in the southern kingdoms where the, the seven are worshipped and north in the north so i mean so something like that right well, it's a weird construct because just like in the real world, it sort of simultaneously uh, upholds the status. Well, it, what it is is it upholds the status quo while promising a little bit of mobility, like just enough to keep people kind of satisfied. I don't know. I, I think it's sort of a tool of the nobility to keep people less upset with what is a pretty shitty system. I don't really, I, I don't really feel like it's offered in the in the stories in the world as a. Uh, as a social mobility thing, like work hard, you'll be a knight. I mean, like, I guess a little bit, but I don't feel like it's a thing that where like, everybody's like, Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I was born poor, but you know, I've got a decent chance of being a knight. I guess maybe it's sort of like being a millionaire in America or something like work hard. You'll be a millionaire, work hard. You'll be a knight. But like, nobody really thinks they're going to be one. (laughs) Bron did really well with his knighthood, right? I mean, his growth was exponential. Before, he was a common cell sword, barely noticeable. Tyrion only noticed him because he was in need of him. Then when he became a knight, suddenly uh, the the other... Uh, who's the, who, who did he eventually marry? Lollies, right? Stockwork. Right, Lawless, and they, she got noticed by them, and and it wasn't too out there for Lawless's family to marry her to him. So his his growth, his uh, trajectory was exponential, and and it's kind of the same thing with Dunk also, right? I mean, before he was like a squire, nobody. Then, uh, I mean, of course, if he would be in a completely different place if he didn't meet Egg, but yeah. his upward trajectory is also kind of fast. But it's it's also not really designed to sort of be a safety valve for the um like actual small folk it's more for the people with guns like it it convinces people like Braun, who are like sellswords or soldiers who have military experience that like they're not they have a chance of sort of moving up in the world and they're the people who would actually be a threat to you in this sort of more feudal system is bands of sort of mercenary men yeah, it makes them complicit in whatever the nobility is doing by yeah. giving them a little bit of privilege. Exactly. So in the modern day context, they're probably like CPAs, probably chartered public accountants. You know, <laughs> if you're a regular accountant, nobody cares. But if you're a CPA, you can do taxes. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even say that they're just complicit. I would say that they're they're also um, encouraged to be loyal because it's obviously you're in great debt if a lord or a knight makes you a knight. Uh, it's a very powerful um way of gaining loyalty obviously uh to give that kind of offer i just think that even if there's there's room for abuse um in just lords being able to hold all the cards and make knights or kings i think that when any knight can make a knight there's just so much room for exponential abuse of that power because if anyone has that power and can use it to any end i mean obviously you're not going to have infestations of knights running around because there there is some kind of um Re- you have to have some kind of reason generally for doing it but i still think that it's it's concerning when you can just make anyone a knight on no basis other than the fact that you are one that obviously but pedigree is. is very important to knighthood like you can't just be like oh i was knighted and someone's like by who and you're like some dude you never heard of that guy's not going to be like oh great i'm so proud of you the whole point is to be like i was knighted by Rhaegar himself you know i was knighted by prince balor like that's what makes you i don't know it gives you an edge over the other knights so like you want to sort of prove that you are a worthy knight before you start just like tossing knighthoods out to other people. 
Yeah, though, yeah. I, that's why I find it really strange that that uh, they ask for egg or dunk to knight Raymond Fossaway. Like, why why dunk when you have so many other much more distinguished knights than him? Because it's his fight, and because he's already being made famous by this trial of the seven. Like, it is like you you would be like, oh, I was knighted by Sir Dunk the Tall, who like died in that trial of the seven, or who won that <laughs> trial of the seven. Fair Either point. way, you're gonna be. It's the first one in a hundred years. It's it's a yeah, it's a big, big deal. Occasion. I may be confusing it. I haven't re- reread the story in a while now. Did Dunk win something else apart from jousting? Did he win like melee or something like that? No, he didn't do anything before the the trial of seven. He didn't participate in the trial. Oh, okay, okay. I'm confusing it with the other movie for the ah oh, crap. I forgot the name of Mystery that. Mystery Night. And uh, no, no, the movie. A Knight's uh, Tale. The... A Knight's oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, with that said, um, does anyone else want to have any thoughts on the um, the small folk bit, uh, whether or not their perspective is important, whether that is a thing that is desired in a Saga of Ice and Fire novels, or if it's just something that belongs in a short story, different, off-the-road kind of thing like this? Mm, I mean, I think it's an interesting and important perspective, but I do think that this is a different story than a Song of Ice and Fire, and I don't know if it would, if a Song of Ice and Fire is lacking this, like, I don't that's not the way I'd feel about that. Yeah, I mean, A Song of Ice and Fire is, is pretty clearly, you know, not about the small folk. I mean, he could have written that series of novels, but he decided to write novels about, uh, you know, various nobles. And yeah, I think know, it's. I don't. I don't do think with, it's missing anything. Right. I think it's more more to do with if they are interesting or something. You know, uh, Braun would have made an interesting POV uh, than Brian, in my opinion. <laughs> I love Brian, though. That's just yeah. you, Vic. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I take, I take Bron also, but uh, I don't know if I'd want a Bron POV. Like, I feel like that'd be a little painful. But maybe a Bron like tagging along with Brienne or something. That'd be pretty bad too, actually. <laughs> that would, yeah. <laughs> so I feel like my my perspective on Bron is being slightly diluted by his very crass version in the uh, the show for sure. Yeah, the show version is a lot more fun. The show, yeah. I mean, the show tried to do something like this with Arya as a cupbearer for... Oh, well, yeah, Arya as a cupbearer in the books, too, for Ruth Bolton. Her perspective was interesting, but it's Arya, so it can last outside Ruth Bolton's chambers also. But if it was some random cupbearer cup bearer somewhere else, that would also have not been too bad. Yeah, but if we had characterized a small folk character, would it would it have been so bad? Like the fact that it's Arya is just the fact that we know Arya. If we had known a small folk character in that position, would that have been good? I mean, I, I don't think it would have been you know bad or good. I'm, I'm sure George uh, could have made it work um, if he had decided to do that. I just think that generally it's it must have been a pretty conscious decision on his part to make I, basically all of the POVs uh, nobles. I mean, that's the story he's telling. But we got, I think, uh, Ari. I think Arya is is probably more a common folk right now than uh, than a noble lady, right? She was never a noble lady, so. I mean, sure. I mean, but you can also look at it from the perspective of just like what people come from, right? In terms of uh, the way they view the world is going to be uh, different uh, because yeah. of the station that they started in. And also, well, there are but different. Act- Davos is clearly. Uh, if you're talking about the station they started out in, then you can't deny that Davos is a small folk perspective. Sure, that's true. Um, I mean, but at least, I guess you could say, like, both Davos and Arya in that way are sort of half and half, in that Davos started out as a small folk and now he's not, and uh, Arya started off well-born, but has, uh, you know, not been treated that way for a while. Yeah, to some degree, I think that it's impossible to have a character that's truly just purely a small folk. Because even Dunk, he quickly becomes a very important person in the world. Uh, just being a part of this Trial of Seven, uh, having Aegon as his squire, and eventually, of course, becoming Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. I think that, um, I guess, to have an important character in the story, they have to have some kind of impact on the world to some well, degree. Just structurally, you can't really write about, like... Right, just some boring the... nobody person. It yeah, just, like, it's not appealing. At best, they have to be a, someone who was born small folk or who experiences what it's like to be small folk and then has sort of a different life. Like, they can't right. just be a farmer the whole time. Yeah, and that's why Davos, uh, even though he is uh, originally small folk, he still has a very important role as a knight and a confidant of Stannis and eventually his uh, hand of the king. Uh, even he still is very important to the progress of the story in general. 
Yeah, because if you just had a normal small folk perspective, it'd be like, oh, I've made this farm. Oh, no. Gregor has burnt down my farm. I've been slaughtered and murdered. <laughs> yeah. I almost <laughs> wish that someone parodied uh, just the story of some Riverlands uh, small folk. <laughs> just how awful it is. That'd be kind of fun, but obviously not something that belongs in the main story, probably. Yeah, probably not. You never know. Yeah, the lasting songs of Ice and Fire needs is more characters. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I guess we can move on to assorted speculations. I have some written down here, or just uh, general thoughts on the story, of course. And anyone can bring any others up that they may have. So the first one that typically comes up when talking about this story is whether or not Dunk was truly knighted by Sir Arlen. It seems unlikely, given the information we get and the hints we get in this book, and, or in this novella, and the, some of the others. Specifically, that he is very, very uncomfortable with the idea of knighting Raymond Foss away before the Trial of Seven. So, any thoughts on that? I think it's probably just a matter of technicality, mm-hmm. just because he hasn't performed that kind of ritual. Uh, but, but Penny Tree was always going to make him a knight. So, like, I mean, we can extend this to what uh, uh, Barristan will probably need to do. Uh, I mean, Barristan thinks about this, right? Whether to make the kids into knights, the, the orphans he's been teaching. Um, I mean, I would think if Barristan dies without knighting those kids, uh, spo- no, this is not a spoiler alert, by the way. Nothing has happened to Barristan. Or, no, sorry. <laughs> no, cut that part out. Uh, we Something know may or may not happen to Barristan. No comments. <laughs> Uh, but but you know I would consider the kids knight because they've been at least been trained by a proper knight right so it's kind of like Bill Gates he dropped out of Stanford but you don't big big grudge him you don't call him oh he's an uneducated some slob right no he's a Stanford educated uh, ungraduated guy yeah but that's like everybody calls Gregor sir or not Gregor uh Sandor sir all the time even though he's not a knight because he made it right so yeah maybe maybe people like to uh stanford likes to claim uh bill gates or whatever but it's just not true you know i mean if barristan doesn't knight those kids they're not knights and uh, similarly a dunk who i think pretty obviously didn't get knighted uh you know isn't really a knight but it's the training i feel you know uh, this, no, I mean, at I'll, the end of the day it's uh, the knighting ceremony is probably like a certificate right so i don't okay. i don't think so at all not in not in westeros um i mean also the training i mean like i think you know anybody who's um you know raised in a castle or you know whatever who, any, any man at arms is given um probably as much training as dunk ever got yeah mm-hmm. he's got the training so yeah, but it'll destroy their social structure if everyone just starts becoming knights in some sense. Like, look at what happens in Princess and the Queen when they just start ran- knighting random people during the riot. Yeah, I think we also see that after the Battle of Blackwater. You have so many new knights running around, and they're clearly not up to the task. Except maybe, I mean, Bronn is obviously capable himself. He's like the, the obvious example, but he's definitely not knightly material or lordly as he eventually becomes. Yeah, but I feel that's a key part of George R. R. Martin telling us something about how during war and civil war, um, things get degraded and corrupted. So you should have all these kind of poor knights made during war who wouldn't really know such thing. I think that's kind of quite deliberate. Right. At the end of Battle of Blackwater, don't they make all the mercenaries into knights too? Absolutely. Pretty much, yeah. There's tons of knighting. Like, they, they, they have to, I think <laughs> they, they have the step to Baylor, like, going all night. <laughs> Apparently, like, that's the description. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. <laughs> we got to reward the people who are supporting your unsustainable feudal system somehow. Yeah, and it's not like it really means anything. You're not giving them money. Yeah. It's also historically incredibly accurate, right? Whenever, if you read back about any of the famous aristocratic families in England, the major- the, there's two kind of key times when a lot of these people, like the first Earl of whatever was created, the, 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 the first key cohort was in 1066 when the Normans invaded our asses, and then William gave all the kind of key bannermen who supported him dukedoms in England. And the second key time is sort of um, sort of when Henry V, when he was fighting the French, would start sort of creating people, the Earl of whatever, because they helped him sack cannon. At the time, they would have been sort of ditch water mercenaries, even though now they're great, illustrious families. So yeah. I think it's I think it's fake history that nicely shows us the kind of grum, grungy reality behind all the sort of high banners. So it's it's, it's awesome George R. R. Martin stuff there. Yeah, the grim um, roots of all true nobility. Yeah, exactly. So then we 
intimidated by these great houses because they all have their feet in clay. Right, and and being becoming a knight doesn't automatically give you any privileges. The only privilege I think is you can enter a list, and that is also still doubtful if you're not being knighted by a good authority. So it's not like at inns and stuff you are getting a discount or something. Like Dunk did not get any privileges at the inns, uh, or at the weapons mitts. Oh, you are you are a knight. Here's a fifteen percent discount uh, on the shield. Like, how much, is, how much <laughs> is it to enter a list when you can just get killed? I mean. Like program recently on I think it was Anglo Saxon Britain, so like the eleventh century, and they were just describing how insanely dangerous it was to joust. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, why why that would be seen as something to aspire to, I have no clue. Yeah, so and also glory. it's just a it's a terrible risk reward too. I mean you've got to win two to make any money at all, and if you lose one and if you lose if you don't win any, then you're uh, completely destitute. Right. It's a rap- so the best case is kind of the, the typical case, if you're lucky, is destitution. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a. I was thinking about that when Dunk was talking. It was first talking about going to to uh, participate in the tourney, and it's just like that is a hell. Like you're better off like walking into a tavern or something and like betting somebody, you know, double or nothing on a coin flip. <laughs> yeah, it's a racket. It's you know. That's it's, the that's the attraction of gambling, isn't it? It's just the risk. Yeah, I mean, if you win, there's a lot of money in it. Being yeah. able to ransom off arms and armor that's a lot of coin in that so it's definitely high stakes gambling to an extreme i mean it's like the lottery though it's designed to steal money from the sort of poor and uneducated right this yeah, it's a tax we, on the poor right and we get that guy in the mystery night who is taking advantage of the system uh, yeah. to a pretty significant degree and that's pretty awesome that he's got that figured out yeah i love that i don't know that i think it's designed to steal money from the poor i think i think it's more like a uh, a way of trying to keep poor people out by having sort of a high bar for entrance well yeah there's a high bar for entrance but it's also like when you do get in it, it's right, not I, like, it's not a forgiving system sure i just meant i meant that that risk i don't think i don't think that that's there so that the nobles can you know score an extra 80 stags or 100 stags or no whatever. no you're right it's, you're right. it's there because they want people who can't afford to lose 80 stags not to participate yeah that's a fair point yeah dunk i don't think is the norm necessarily the character who is won or lost on a single bout i think that usually it's just the lords that are doing it for entertainment reasons or again to gain glory and they don't mind if they lose a set of armor or a horse it's not a big deal to them they can just get another one they probably have another one already yeah i think the poor are just uh, just you know are the audience and they're just enjoying the show i think right i mean it's just to keep the appease the masses uh from boredom i guess yeah so I would say it's pretty awesome to end with it uh, on this point that uh, that a uh, someone who wasn't a knight was made Lord Commander of the King's Guard. That's pretty cool. Um, I would think he probably got knighted at some point, hopefully, because I feel like Egg knows. No, but I don't think he ever admitted it to anyone that he wasn't a knight. Right. I don't think so either, though it could happen. We haven't seen. I, I don't even know if we're going to get that far in the novellas. Like, I don't know if it's intended to go that far, but I guess we'll find out. Yeah, I, I mean, I sort of I withhold judgment. I think it's possible that... Uh, at some point, Dunk would tell Egg, and Egg would rectify the situation. But it very well may be that that no one ever found out. Would yeah, we, that's what I bet on. Would people be disappointed if we didn't get up to Summerhall in the novellas? Like, I personally wouldn't mind. I, th- I like that they're not going that far, and that it's still a mystery. But people, do people really want to know what happened there? I mean, I just like reading them. I just want them to keep going. Like, if he writes them for a while and then gets bored and doesn't reach Summerhall, I won't be heartbroken. But if these are the only three we get, I'd be pretty sad. I'd Same. I'd like to get to Summerhall. I'm yeah. I, I mean, you know, I'm not going to tear my hair out or anything if we don't, but I'd like to get there. He might cover a summer hall in that World of Ice and Fire encyclopedia thing. No, I don't think he does. So I don't think. Yeah, yeah exactly. he's just going to be burnt, like you said before. <laughs> it's not going to be in there. It's going to be like a master's point of view, so you still won't have like the details, but uh, you'll know <laughs> what happened, what went in, and what came out at least. I don't care whether it's in a Duncan Egg or the main Song of Ice and Fire stories, maybe with someone reminiscing about it or telling us explicitly this is what happened at Summer Hall. I just don't want it to be in World of Ice and Fire because I have this awful suspicion it's going to turn out like the Princess and the Queen, or it's just a maester like reciting 10 pages of lists of names of peeps who were attending. You know, I, I think I, it's I even going to be less narrativized than, than the Princess of the, and the Queen. It's just going to be a bunch of various blurbs about things and not all, of course, written just by George. I, I think that the Princess and the Queen is, is much 
is going to be much more appealing in that sense than, than the, uh, well, the Western Empire will be. Yeah, so I, I want Summer Hall, which is such a pivotal, dramatic piece of exposition to be done as part of a novella where it's George at his full fictional writing height. Um, and I don't care which book it comes in, but I really want to have it. This next bit of speculation, I, I don't really believe it personally, but we're free to talk about it. Since everyone has to be a secret Targaryen, there is the speculation that Dunk could be a secret Targaryen. <laughs> what do you guys think of this? No, absolutely no. I will flip a table. Dunk cannot be a Targaryen. There's already too many. <laughs> it just isn't. It's just not true. Yeah, it seems it seems completely pointless and uh, with with nothing to back it up. So it's one of the sillier crackpot theories I've ever heard. I mean, it's you know he's he might be a Merling, but you know, yeah. <laughs> I would. It is more likely that he is a Merling. I will stake <laughs> money on that. <laughs> What's the person that is it usually? Yeah, what's with the Merling thing? Is that about Varys? It's about Varys. Yeah. Varys, yeah. That's a what is a Merling? <laughs> like a merman, I think. Oh. <laughs> like the theory is like because he gets to Essos really fast or something. Or like him and Illyrio, they can like yeah. swim over and. Uh, what? Little finger. The yeah, actual the ship is yeah. called Merling King. Right. Like, that's his like he's baiting Varys because he apparently knows something about him. <laughs> right. Ridiculous. There's a whole lot of like, there's a bunch of different stuff. Like, he wears robes, so no one sees his legs and stuff. It's <laughs> there's a, there's a ton of stuff. Like, if you read uh, the long version of it, it's like every time uh, Varys mentions water in any way, it's sort of like, see here, he was talking about. It's pretty funny. I mean, it's like it's that really really long. Like, just keep on paddling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That exactly like that. Yeah. Wow. Oh my god, that's the weirdest crackpot theory I've ever heard. <laughs> it's not the weirdest one, trust me. They're weird. It's not. There's one that says that Tywin wrote all the letters to Reese Bolton at Heron Hall that are supposed to be from Fat Walda. <laughs> <laughs> what about um, the engine start is Dario? Have you read that one? Oh, right. I mean, it's trying to spread that. I mean, it's trying to make that a new thing now. That one's pretty cool. Nice. All right, so... Uh, I guess to move something that's a little bit more plausible, or at least maybe not, um, is Tanzel too tall, old man? Apparently, this is also a theory. I, I think that the way yeah. that the stories, yes, okay, it's well, plausible. I'll, I'll say that I think that the way the stories work right now, Dunk kind of well, he doesn't really in the Mystery Night, but he kind of just meets like a new liaison sort of in each story. And I imagine since we're supposedly getting the next one in the North slash Winterfell, he'll meet the old man character there. But I guess it could also be. Plaus- plausible. Can so, you guys talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the basis is just the fact that we get that... This is a pretty big spoiler, but it's fine. Um, we get that vision in Dance where we see Dunk kissing a tall girl in Winterfell. Yeah. And the fact that she's tall and that she's met her before it points to Tenzel. That anyone that would be tall enough... Or, and also it's as slender as a spear. Spear is Dorn. That's the um, the speculation there. Okay, yeah. thanks. And, and um, I think uh, Hodor's um, Hodor also adds up to that somehow. Um, and uh, Hodor is old man's great great grandson, and he's really tall, and Dunk is really tall, and I think it just that's supposed to be evidence. Do you guys think that Hodor is his grandson or great grandson or whatever? Because yeah. I definitely, definitely do, and I also definitely think that Brienne is descended from him. Yeah, how how because we know that Dunk left his shield at um. Tarth. So how did he get there? Like, when did this happen? And I guess that's another thing to uh, maybe look forward to in new novellas. Yeah, yeah, Dunk would have had to give up his shield much sooner, right? Because when you become a king's guard, you get a white shield instead. So, yeah. so you know. But do we know that the pe- person that Brand saw is actually Duncan? Because he kind of said a tall knight and a tall spear-like lady. So it's yeah, definitely- it's just guess fuck that it's Dunk. Yeah, it's definitely not a concrete theory, but that's pretty much just the, the idea is that it could be Tenzel because of those little literary references of the spear and the fact she's tall. Um, though, if if he is indeed the um, the um, sire of the future existence of Hodor and Brienne, um, is the next theory that uh, Dunk was the Brandon Stark of his time? Is, it, <laughs> is he getting yes. around? He was. Hey, we all know from Hodor that Dunk's probably packing. <laughs> Oh. There's the oh. I remember in the um, podcast of Ice and Fire there was great speculation on his um his uh package in the graphic novel apparently it's uh, really, yeah, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> so I guess that's true. Um, 
the next thought I always had whenever I read this story is how the hell do these people carry all their coins around? Because um, Dunk needs 750 stags to buy, or he gets 750 stags by selling his horse. Obviously, you're not selling or buying horses every day. That you don't normally deal in that many that amount, but. That's such a ridiculous amount of coins to carry around. I guess that it may be converted to gold, um, to a hundred or to ten, but still, like, I can't. Im- it just blows my I, mind. I actually said. saw this in Black Sail, uh, the new Michael Vesha. Uh, they they had to like carry two thousand gold coins, and they wanted to be discreet, so they converted it to pearls, where each pearl is two hundred coins. So that way, they only needed ten pearls to carry around. So there could be other things other commodities of value yeah but if you look at some of the numbers and what apparently the currency exchanges are they're ridiculous like it's like like twenty thousand silver stags for like like a moon or something it's it's crazy like i don't understand yeah it could be 700 coin gold coins and carrots also so (laughs) So, yeah that monthly economics is not draw a month yeah that's what i was about to say i mean I, i think that it's basically just uh you know, sort of the uh, uh, everything's always in gold coins and fantasy stories, so everything has to be in gold coins. But uh, realistically, presumably, people would have you know things like letters of credit and and stuff like that. Yeah, you could also just like there are goods that are far more valuable than gold, so like pearls, diamonds, and things like that. Yeah, land. I mean, well, the if you own land in Westeros too, that would be much more. I, yeah. I don't know. Land is already a big deal, and it's hard to manage. Well, it's probably easier in, here in the Western countries than in the East. You know, you always have, uh, you know, uh, people who occupy lands and all that stuff happening. So it's kind of hard to maintain a land uh, in case if the law and order system in the city is not good. Uh, you know, people with the more muzzle and tug can take over land and claim it theirs. Uh, yeah. So, True. so land probably is not too reliable an asset in Westeros unless you well, I, are in person there and guarding it, fenced it, and everything. I think it was considered much more valuable. Like generally speaking, land was considered much more valuable uh, during this sort of like time period than than today. Yeah, because you didn't have to worry about like if someone you don't have to worry about anyone going going on strike or zoning permits or something. It's just like it's your kingdom if you own it. But uh, do the commoners get to own lands? They have to pay rent, right? They're tenants. I don't think they're even... I don't know if they're tenants or if they're serfs, honestly. Uh, I mean, just... I would I would suspect there are probably some of each, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't think you get yeah, to own your land. You just have a right to farm it or something like that. Yeah, the, the, the lowest of the low... It's kind of where the word villain comes from, isn't it? Like, but villain, it, was, it meant the kind of people really tied to the land almost like serfs. Um, like the concept of like common holder was was late medieval. I think. Right, we see this and more in this phone sword where the the knight, uh, the landed knight, I forget his name, uh, the Czech Czechy lion guy. Uh, he of course uh, he has villagers who farm his land, but. And so the villagers pay tenant to the knight, but the knight can be taken away by the lord of the the lord of the province. So, yep. so you know, it's all very. And the king can come and take over take over that. So that's the thing with despotism. You know, there's no real law and order there. It's it's whatever the kings want, whoever's carrying the favor at that point in time. Uh, yeah. We we still have eminent domain now, Vic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can make that argument at any point in time. I think that. The, the capricious nature of whoever is in power, whatever they want to do, really, you're subject to. I guess to an extent, it's more of a problem in Westeros, but it's definitely you never really are safe in your uh, your assets. I just think it's more of a point at any in any country where there's potential war, right? I mean, that's the yeah. people in Ukraine getting their assets frozen or whatever. So yeah, I mean, we get a we get a pretty war. powerful example of this with the Blackfire Rebellion that shakes things up to an extreme with lords that were backing. Uh, Daemon getting completely torn apart and lo- losing all of their power. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's just like a joust writ large, basically. Yeah. <laughs> if you win, yeah, then you just... get if you win, then you get some other lord stuff, and if you lose, then you're going to lose half it, most of your stuff. Yeah. And of course, kind of, again, at this kind of time in, in the, the legend of Robin Hood, the concept of an outlaw being someone who not in a romantic kid story, someone who sort of robs the rich and gives the poor and runs around being cool, but someone who was just outside of the law because they'd been, they'd forfeited their lands 
and because they'd gone off to the Crusades, so someone, some like local lord just nicked their land. And if you didn't have land, you were no longer kind of legitimate as a lord. You had no literal base to your power, and suddenly you were outside of it. So, yeah, that's, I think it's all very interesting. That's why I think craftsmen are actually pretty, uh, it's a good place to be in this world. If you're a commoner, it's, you'd rather be a craftsman because there you have nothing to be taken away you have your tools you have your anvil or your forge or something and you always get to keep it uh, nobody's going to take away from you and plus i'm thinking how are they going to get taxed the farmers it's easy to get taxed kind of because you see okay you have so many bushels of corn or something but with an ironsmith who's going to go and say blacksmith who's going to go and say how many armors did you forge this year okay you need to give me one armor for every 10 you did but if if you're a talented black- blacksmith or like you know gendry classic example exactly, yes for sure no one yeah. can save your livelihood but they can capture you and so you know the classic example being in the russian revolution where people would sort of steal doctors and take them away with them to the front if you have a <laughs> skill you yourself physically become a commodity just as gendry became a commodity a because of his use in harren hall you know he was useful and skillful but then because of his blood so yeah. in a way it's because they can't take take away your shit as tax, they take you as tax. Yeah. But at the same time, craftsmen are usually the first people to start, like guilds and craftsmen are the first to sort of like start to push against feudalism. Sort of some of the feudalism, yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. so another thought I had on this idea is because is apparently the uh, coins they're using are minted with King Daron's um, face and i think that that's kind of strange that they're able to so quickly put them in circulation actually i just saw this on the hbo store they are selling coins uh but it's got it's got uh the stark uh, M- uh sigil and eddard stick on it well, that doesn't so make I'm, any I'm, sense so i'm thinking <laughs> no. every lord probably has a coin of his own or as long as the coin weighs whatever one ounce or whatever is the standard the everybody's have a, good i think yeah the manderleys have a mint mm, so i think everybody has a mint I don't think everybody does. I think Manderleys do. I think Lannisters do. But I think that they they contribute to the circulation of. I don't know. It, yeah. Obviously, and it's again, hard to say. That's, yeah. That's really Nick historically accurate. At this time, the the royal family would not, or the government in Westminster or wherever in King's Landing would not have a monopoly on the printing of coin. And yeah, not every family would have one, but you'd have two or three. So in England, you would have two or three. Um, I, and then depend. It was really funny actually. Like you could tell how civil wars were going by. You know, whether the Northern Mint had decided to change the face on the coin to the guy who was supposedly winning in the South. And then you'd have the Mint in the middle of England, like, sort of playing neutral and just putting kind of crosses on each side of the coin and stuff like that. So, yeah. I always... I I always wondered this. Um, so we know why the gold coins are called dragons, and but why are the silver ones called stags? Because I don't think they were called stags after Robert came to power. They were called stags even before, right? I believe so. Yes. Why? Why stags? There's another of all name things, for silver because coins. That's... There's like silver moons too. Silver moons. So, okay. So it could be that they were introduced later. I, I don't know why they're called stags. Uh, maybe it's the Baratheons had like a, the second highest claim to power in West. But we kind of see the martyrs probably had more influence. Uh, no, yeah, martyrs, right? Yeah. No, they had the more Baratheons inf- were, or or Baratheon was Aegon the Conqueror's brother, right? Half brother. Yeah, that could be maybe it. That's, uh, yeah, maybe that's a first And why why didn't Robert undo the dragon thing? Why didn't he promote the stack to a gold or gold stacks maybe, from now on? Maybe he did. It just never caught on. <laughs> <laughs> the Lannisters wouldn't bother. Small folk, yeah, the small folk just kept calling it calling them. It dragon. also just doesn't seem like <laughs> they would ever see a dragon. But. Sorry, it doesn't really seem like the kind of thing Robert would think of or care yeah. about. Because yeah. he hated the Targaryen so much, right? I mean, this is a, it's a very simple degree to do, a decree to do. But it's not that simple when you think about it. You have so many coins in circulation that you can't, like, you have so much gold, you'd have to collect all the gold from everybody and smelt it back down and re recoin it. Yeah, and he's pretty lazy. Well, he's he's been running the country for about 20 years now or something. At least 15 years now. That should give him enough time. What has he done in that? All the coins. Well, John Aaron's been running the country. Yeah, John Aaron. So why didn't he do eagle <laughs> instead? A falcon. It, it should have been a gold <laughs> stag, a silver falcon. Well, I mean, part of it is the, the, the expense of reprinting, um, the expense of rebuilding the mold so that you can reprint like that is going to be pretty <laughs> large. Not like that on tourneys. It's, it's well, so you don't, you don't, so you don't just like. It's not like someone else becomes king, so you 
take back all the coins and you reprint and issue the new ones. It's just like whenever the kind of they'd be rubbed and rubbed and the head would come off, then you sort of submit them back and they'd be then redone. So you'd always have previous coinage still a little bit in circulation, a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. I think the expense is less than we think. It's only just the, the marginal extra new stuff that you'd be reprinting. Also, they justify Robert's... Sorry. No, I'm just apologizing for taking into this kind of like practical logistical level. No, yeah. oh, I also, asked for it. Yeah. This no, question. it's good. Also, yeah. they justify yeah. Robert being king by through his like Targaryen heritage to some extent after like, he, I mean, he usurps, but then they justify it in that way. But more than that, he's he's a king because he has the backing of four of the seven houses in the kingdom, well, yeah. right? So that and even the Lannisters were supporting him. So so yeah. Yeah, but Ned Stark and John Allen were there, right? They chose Robert to be king because his grandmother was a Targaryen. Like, I mean, I, I keep, yeah, I, but I mean, it's it's not like Robert uses the Targaryen banners or anything. I mean, like he is a Baratheon. Well, and, no, but you're. It, well, it's no, he of, doesn't. But John Allen claimed the throne in his name because he was the most targeted of them. Sure, sure, sure. I understand. Uh, and, no. and that's true. But I'm just saying that it's it's not like because of that... Uh, I mean, Rob, it doesn't make Robert a Targaryen. He has some Targaryen blood. He had a better claim to the throne than Ned or John, But he's not a Targaryen. No, he's not. But, like, a lot of people underestimate the importance of his Targaryen grandmother because the thing is that it's it's not about justifying to people why he's the king. It's about, like maintaining the shared illusion of feudalism that blood matters. It's one of the reasons why Renly is so dangerous, because once you start, once you openly admit that what matters is strength, then sure. every succession is fucked. Yeah, so like, absolutely. Sh- sure, he's not really a Targaryen. He doesn't use the banners, but there are only so many pillars of the old regime he can sort of saw away without... Because the Targaryens for- themselves did not have any claim to the Westeros, right? When they landed, when Aegon landed, he was a nobody, right? So, but he he did uh, forge a claim from through battle and subjugation. And Robert Baratheon did the same thing too. So he mm. could have thrown out the yep. entire Targaryen history out and kind of declared that nobody ever talks about the Targaryen, just like nobody ever talks about. No, Castamere. but the difference is that the Targaryens had so much strength and were also establishing a new kingdom, which gave them this sort of, I don't know, they were conquerors, sure, and there are always conquerors in feudalism, but they have to be few and far between or the whole system collapses until someone's strong enough for long enough that their line starts to matter. And like, it, sure, it, it's very foreign. to it, It's not like super, it's not super legitimate, but it's still very important because Cause, you... Because we kind of see examples, right? Like the like the uh, uh, the phrase the phrase get the you know uh, become the wardens of the riverlands and the Stark and the Roose Boltons become the wardens of. Uh, um, wardens of the north so they didn't have any blood relation with the starks yet it's okay for them because they have the backing of the king so it's 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 okay i think claims only go so far like i i like like i think like you take the stark kids for instance or oh, rob has the best claim to the throne but if bran tomorrow found a, a funder uh, somebody to fund him an army uh, he probably could claim the seat and say, okay, I'm the heir to the thing. So, because this happens all the time, I think. Even daughters carry a, a right to claim. Maybe not as strong as son, but if they have a backer, if they have an army, the daughters can do it also. Just like we saw with Princess and the Queen, you know, it's very disputed. It's very, you know, grayish, you know, who had the claim. Is it, it was it uh, the guy or the gal? So, but it turns out the guy had the bigger army or, and he was in a better place at the time. I mean, I don't think anyone's disagreeing with you that, like, it's a silly system and that might is the most important thing. Yeah. But without the sort of fig leaf of legitimacy that claim <laughs> gives you, the whole system crumbles and no one in your coalition will support that. Like, in the long run, practical people won't support that because they know that their son's inheritance will be endangered. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh... I would say it's very, very case by case basis. I think that it really depends on on the scenario at hand. I think that that claims only go so far as um, you can make them go at the given time. Like in the context of these these stories, um, the Blackfire Rebellion only really started because people saw Daemon as a more capable ruler. They were more uncomfortable with um, 
with Daron as leader, given like the events that had happened, um, the sickness and all of that, and they just they um they I mean it just was his support gained on that basis alone. It wasn't really a base of a claim or anything like that. It just no, really... I mean it, it was partly based off a claim. Well, yeah, his partially, gave him the sword. Yeah, he gave him the sword. Um, I, I mean, I, I think don't... without that, it would have been a lot lot less likely, I think, to have happened. Yeah. Without without his father legitimizing him and giving him the sword, I mean, like that's a a realistic claim at that point. Yeah. I mean, I think I think Lee's right. I mean, you have to these people. While obviously the only thing that matters, I mean, it's true today too, right? Like the only thing that matters is that you know the government has all the uh, has all the guns, right? Like that's the only thing that's important. But the fact that everyone agrees that the government is legitimate, more or less, I mean, that's what keeps society together, and it's the same thing with them. Uh, they, I, they all have to believe in the legitimacy of the rulers, or else every, or else it's just an, an anarchy with everybody. Yeah, you know, I, this stabbing. is the whole, this goes back to the whole various is like thing, right? The whole power resides where men believe it resides. Uh, it entirely yeah, depends exactly. on the opinion of the lords. They backed Daemon because they saw it as an opportunity. I think they were opportunistic in that, not so much they were interested in backing him because they felt he was. Yeah, I think they're all very practical about these things. You know, this shows there's some romanticism. Who is the lord? We are houses are by and bound together and there's loyalty his dad was uh, was good to my dad so i'm going to be good to him uh, but ultimately they are practical i think if somebody is offers i'll double your kingdom all you have to do is lend me your army i'm sure they'll go for those things yeah i mean that's definitely true i'm just saying that a major consideration for those lords is how good does this guy's claim look they're, yeah. They won't. They're much less light, likely to back somebody who has a big army if the claim doesn't look good. Because the claim, ultimate people respecting claims is the way that they can, you know, pass on all of their stuff to their kids. And they also, I mean, like especially like a lord, like um, a lot of any of the more conservative sorts of lords, right? Do believe in like a societal order, right? Like they want society to be orderly, and without. Uh, without some respect for rightful kings and whatnot, uh, then society isn't orderly. Yeah. I agree yeah. with that completely, but I think it can be <clears throat> overridden by more pragmatic interests if it they can, exist. Definitely. Of course, yeah. I mean, otherwise, you know, there'd basically be no story. It would just be everybody <laughs> getting together in a room with some judges or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'm just comparing it with real world history like we had in here in India where we had different empires come up with different religions, uh, with different uh, religion as their main religions and stuff like that. And they did not share blood, tie, blood ties with one another. It's all who conquers what, who has a bigger army at any given time and, and things like that. In the, in the Europe, I know it's kind of more mixed, you know, like uh, C- Queen Victoria had uh, you know the 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 king of Prussia, the king of Russia, king of Prussia, and uh, they were all grandsons to Victoria. So yeah. there was a more like thing. So one country could attack another country and claim, oh yeah, it's all it's all this kind of thing. Uh, but in India, it wasn't there. There wasn't much of intermarriage going on between kingdoms per se, especially if they were completely of different religion. But they were able, they were able to conquer another kingdom completely and change the entire system and organizational structure the, because ultimately it's not a thing about popularity i mean among the surf at least there's who cares who the thing this the serfs think are popular it's probably just the lords but if you can replace all the lords you probably will have an uproar and upcry and peasant revolts so you probably couldn't overhaul the system too drastically but well, ultimately robert had probably more initiative and he should have done that Considering the Targaryens had a chance of coming back, he should have been a bit more drastic about it. He, he should have burnt every last every last bit of Targaryen history in Westeros. <laughs> <laughs> so when Danny shows up, they'll be like, "Who's this chick again? Who are the Targaryens again?" I mean, he kind of did though. <laughs> he kind of did though. Not not so much overtly, but he very much. Um, sort of made the the implied idea that if you support Targaryens, you're gonna be in trouble, which is why yeah. like the dairies hid their banners and the walls and stuff. Yeah, and he pardoned Tywin. It's all a balance, you know. You have to you have to sort of get halfway between. Um, there's a bleh, sorry. There is a like an equation between force and claim and popular support, and you have to have enough of some of them, or none of it's gonna work. Um, and it's if you have so much overwhelming force, like the Targaryens or like the 
conquerors of India at a few various points. You can really do whatever, or like William the Conqueror, you can really do whatever you want. But if you're sort of over, if you don't have the overwhelming su superiority of dragons or a huge Norman army, it's going to be a lot harder to sort of just tell everyone to do what you want them to do forever. Got to play that Game of Thrones. <laughs> okay. Uh, to move on to something completely different, um, right. this is from Shellfish slash Peter on the forums. Uh, is Sir Lionel the coolest dude ever or what? He definitely yes. has, yeah, he definitely has like one of the coolest titles from anybody in the story. Yeah, the Laughing Storm. That is yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. He also turns up to support Dunk, right? Even though he doesn't have to. Yeah, but it seems like it's kind of like a joke to him. Like, I'm just gonna fight here because you know. Yeah, it's more like like oh, oh shit, I could yeah, participate but... in a tourney of this in a battle of the seven or whatever it's called. Like, sweet, sign me up. For this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's just he's just uh, uh, a guy who enjoys the tourney and all that. Kind of like a uh, proto Robert, I guess. Yeah, it's basically like, wait, there's two melees in this tourney. Like, I am in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's pretty awesome. Um, I guess in that vein, what is everyone's favorite um, knight slash turning person or even character in the story? Oh, Balon Breakspear for me. Yeah. He is pretty. He is pretty cool. It's, it's a shame that we didn't get to see more of him because he is definitely the probably the best Targaryen in power that we've seen. I think my favorite. It's a little be... too good to be true. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh... He, I mean, he he can. He's so nice to dunk. I mean, he's just a little too good to be true. I mean, nobody's that nice in... in yeah, your, your goodness <laughs> is, is inversely proportional to your life expectancy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a fair point. Uh, no, I think that, I mean, he, he's not, like, totally, like, nice to the point of it being ridiculous. I think that he's just very courteous and he knows how to play people. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, he, yeah. yeah, the trial of seven still happens. It's not like he makes it not happen. Yeah. He 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 makes a point to know. It's obviously a good character trait, but he makes a point to know like everyone he's fought, which is why he recognizes Dunk. But it also it's uh, there's a level of pragmatism to that too. Definitely. Anybody else that anyone wants to mention? I love uh, Steely Pate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, Steely Pate, again, it reminds me of uh, the aforementioned A Knight's Tale, like uh, the, the woman that that's, uh, makes his armor in that. I don't know, he just seems like a cool blacksmith guy that willing to help a guy out kind of person. Raymond Fossil was nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's kind of cool that we like get history that previously like we're like, what the hell, this green apple at Fossil is? It's kind of cool to <laughs> understand how that all started when we're getting that one part in Renly's camp where we're learning about all those people that we have no idea what's going on. Yeah. That's really all I have listed here in terms of speculation or things to mention about the, the story. Anything else anyone wants to bring up? Uh, I would say that I really like, there's an element of the story I really like, which is that it's sort of, it's, I don't know, I, I love the way that George R. R. Martin makes Dunk, uh, the Hedge Knight feel so like bright and fun, like the colors are more vibrant than they are in A Song of Ice and Fire. And I don't know if that's just the narrator or if it's the sort of just that it's like a more fun story in its own way, but like it's something I've always really liked about it. It's just that the story is so much less gray. Um, I think the, there's almost a clear good side and a bad side. I think that's. I, I, I think, think that's having a. Feeling. I think having a kid helps, right? I mean, uh, if there was no egg around, Duncan wouldn't be drawn to the puppet show, right? I mean, a uh, grown-up would be like, oh, puppets, so how, how silly of that. You don't watch SpongeBob SquarePants randomly, right? Uh, if you have a kid or if you have a niece or a nephew, then you watch SpongeBob SquarePants. So, oh, well. <laughs> but basically, I think having a kid in a story helps, you know, <laughs> that you're doing all those goofy stuff. And uh, that's probably why I think the story is more fun because of Egg in it rather than Dunk doing anything. Dunk is probably a bit dull of a character. Uh, yeah, he wouldn't have gotten enough trouble if it wasn't for Egg. Yeah, yeah, I agree generally with all, all of that. I think that the story is made by the relationship between Dunk and Egg. Dunk is kind of like an idiot, and Egg balances him pretty well. But but he's so upstanding and so just just um, stubbornly um, willing to help people that it, it just makes a good mix. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Amanda, you wanted to talk on the upstanding citizen that is Arian Brightflame. Well, I don't know that I have a ton to talk yeah. about him with, but we haven't really talked about him at all. And yeah. he's really, I don't know, he's such a sick bastard. <laughs> Especially all the implied, like, 
weird, shady, almost door creaking stuff with egg. Not so much implied. Almost? I mean, egg no, is a liar. Like not even implied. Just, yeah. Egg's a liar, but it seems likely that he's not lying about that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, egg, eggs how, how old? 11? 12? 10 or 11, I think. Yeah. It's a pretty detailed discussion of what Arion says to him when yes. he comes to his room at night. I don't think he's making that up. Yeah, yeah I don't think so either. I think I'm obli- obligated to make the jerk. Uh, he's 10 years old. He's a man grown. Winter is coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, he's a horrible person. Um, glad he killed himself. <laughs> yeah. Did he drink what wildfire or something? Yeah. <laughs> he wanted to become a dragon. <laughs> what he thought he was a dragon. Yeah, he thought he was a dragon. He thought it would make him into a real dragon by drinking the wildfire. What about the um, drunk Targaryen, Daron? Daron? I, I mean, mean yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's pathetic, but he's like he's cool. I mean, I, it's kind of strange. I think is he the only Targaryen we get directly that has prophetic dreams? Uh, there's well, also the Danny. mystery knight. Uh, yeah, there, I mean, oh yeah, 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 the fiddler yeah, also. also um, yeah, I like him a lot. I feel bad for him. Yeah, I mean, he's waited with uh, a lot of expectation, um, being the first son. Mm-hmm. He just doesn't want to live up yeah, to it. Son of a right, but still, I mean, he's still obligated to some degree. I mean, he's the uh, Makar is the prince of Summerhall. Like, he's not just a nobody uh, prince. Like, that has no. Well, yes, but he just likes to drink. He's, there's no excuse. Do you guys know who was running Dragonstone at the time? That's interesting uh, that Makar was. Baylor, Baylor. Baylor was given. The heir apparent is the prince of Dragonstone, so yeah, it'd be him. Yeah. That's a lot of responsibility. I mean, he's the prince of Dragonstone. He's the hand king. He's doing everything. That's kind of how it worked, though, um, with Targaryens in the past. They always kind of worked within their own, which could lead to bad things. In this case, it turned out to be good be- because both Daron and um, and Baylor were good rulers, uh, apparently. Mm-hmm. Like we don't know for sure, but it seems like they were. Yeah, they seemed like they were pretty confident, which is rare. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and the comparison is a is a great example of just that that whole point. I think that is first brought up in the show actually that uh, Cersei makes that. That uh, Targaryens are like flipping a coin, <laughs> where you got the Aryan bright flame, and then you have the Baylor break spear. Yeah, I think even even Makar was pretty competent. He was just uh, blinded where his son. He was just blind where his sons were concerned. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it in the context of of the society, it's probably pretty um, tough to realize that your first two sons are are mess-ups in their own way. Your third is a, a maester in training, though the best target you are. No, I think he understands that his eldest is messed up. He yeah. just doesn't realize it about Ar- Arian. And he's, uh, I think he knows Arian's not right. He just doesn't want, doesn't have the competency or the willingness to do anything about it. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. yeah. Cool. yeah. I don't know. There's not a ton of discussion in this one. It's such a, it's such a lovely, like refreshing, sweet little story. But it's not super meaty, and there's not a lot we can say without like hugely spoiling later stories. Have yeah, you, I agree. Did I you guys know inter- this? Uh, King Makar actually died in a battle with the outlaws. It happens in like the seventh chapter in Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, in a Catelyn chapter, she says that Makar died uh, in a battle with the outlaws. Yeah, I think we hear about that in in the Sworn Sword too. Like they all, all of them are killed. Or a lot of them were killed off. Right, but not point. how they died eventually. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think Maker is still actually alive at that point. Um, oh yeah, he's alive throughout the thing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the other Targaryens died though in the the Spring Sickness and the, the Rebellion. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that more of the intrigue and like the sort of more worldly politics do come in the, in the later in the later stories, and we'll be sure to get to those. I just think that this story is just like a just an excellent, like you say, the introduction into the into this this period in the world. It's a very fun, exciting story, very distinct from the main series, and um, yeah. that's all I'd really say about it. It's just it was it was a joy to read. I was so happy that I that I picked up the the anthology despite the cost and 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 found this one because I seriously <laughs> love these stories. It really is a joy to read. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I guess that's about it, guys. Thank you so much for joining me for this uh, VOK on the Hedge Night. It was a lot of fun. We will be continuing um, with the Sworn Sword at some point in the future. Probably, I think, after the um, the show finishes airing. Because I think, yeah. Vic, we do have uh, some kind of thing planned for the show at some point, right? 
uh oh yeah oh so yeah yeah we're still thinking about it we'll, we'll probably do the traditional review episodes of course but since we kind of have to put them out at, this, at a, such a quicker rate and we have to probably record them in a week i'm 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 just thinking of this now maybe we'll probably will do a multiple of them um like uh, dunk uh, uh, duncan could take uh take care of you know uh, stuff in the other side of the world and uh, we could do it here so everybody in like like nadia you could probably go to dunk's podcast uh <laughs> and uh, zach we and all can do it on we can do a u.s version of it you know something like that maybe <laughs> yeah that's kind yeah. of what uh i think it wasn't a mean or somebody saying something like that a few months ago was that he sort of uh would be interested in having like multiple podcasts with sort of different viewpoints and whatnot yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to that. That could be fun. Yeah, I mean, a yeah. lot of people are probably going to want to talk about it. it yeah, exactly. Sense. You don't want a 15-person podcast. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Songs of Ice and Fire podcasts always do the most well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. of the four podcasts that cross the thousand mark, three of them were uh, Songs of Ice and Fire related. So we don't want to miss out on this opportunity. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Still don't know what's the most uh, uh, way we can do best. I didn't want to do reviews because it's everybody does it. You know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry podcast out there is going to do it. Do they need a 10th podcast also discussing the show? Pretty much every talking point is going to be out there. So I wanted to do something, you know, something different, you know, not just reviews, but nothing occurs to me that could be fun. <laughs> Mm. I, I think reviews are fine. I think it's just fun to talk about the show, honestly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, like, if you don't really think, you don't have to think of them as just, like, a dull review sort of thing. I mean, it's really, I mean, most of these podcasts are just people sort of chatting about, yeah. you know, what they liked, what they didn't like, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's just so many out there, right? Like, boy. Yeah, the, I mean, I know what Game of Owns, uh, what is it, uh, Boar's Goods and Swords, uh, then uh, Night's Watch, and uh, yeah, there's just a ton of them, and I'm sure people are listening to multiple of them. So, the only thing it would be is, it, it's a, it's us forum people, so, you know, you, you forum people can come on, it's going to be our kind of thing, we're going to be talking about stuff that's more relevant to us. Uh, yeah. Actually, there yeah. are not too many podcasts out there that 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 cover the entire series at a time, right? I think Songs of Ice and Fire, Boil Leather is the only two podcasts I know that that don't have that go spoiler filled. And us. And us. So so okay. So we are not like one in ten. We are probably one in three. <laughs> Third in that rank. <laughs> For For now, until we disturb the throne. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, but we might, pro- but we may probably do multiple of them. Maybe there'll be a A team, B team, and C team depending on your time zones. <laughs> That's how they they film the show, so it only makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Oh yeah, actually, that's not a bad idea. Oh, we can be the dragon unit. There can be a wolf unit. <laughs> we, can, <laughs> we can also just edit them together. Uh, oh, dude. Uh, that would That'd be crazy. Is this one, one four and a half hour podcast? No, no, no. Well, edit, I mean, edit them the back and forth, like sure. five minutes of one. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> no, that'd be, that'd be awesome. That sounds like a nightmare. Wow, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> who, would, who would volunteer to edit that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel like the full castle recordings are having a hard enough time with recording editing with that many humans well duncan said a, a high standard with the first one so. it's true <laughs> i i was completely surprised by that how good it was i didn't expect that i thought it was have you guys listened to the stuff reads we've done for fees dance uh the first feast dance ever we did the Dao scene and then we did the Harry Potter thing. So yeah. We were expecting something bad like that, but you guys blew us away. It's like a completely different league here. Yeah, people actually came prepared with voices. Oh, yeah, goodness. yeah, it's very well, very well. Done. Yeah, I was thinking probably something along those lines, but we probably everybody would want us have a say on the on the reviews. Yeah, right. yeah, I think it makes sense. Um, yeah. another thing to mention, I guess, is that the new anthology that George will be publishing, a uh, Princess and the Queen style book, was just announced. Rogues with um, the Rogue Brother or Rogue Prince. What is the name? But, Rogue Prince. Prince. Yeah, but, Rogue Prince. But it's and, not going to be a Song of Ice and Fire story, right? It's just a, his introduction thing. Oh, I no, it, it is. Oh. There's going to be a, no, no. one about. Yeah, it's going to be about Daeron, Daemon. No, Daemon. Daemon. Yeah. Yeah. Daenerys has been like, it's like Princess and the Queen style. I think the same maester, even. It's like the same kind of idea. Maybe a, a bit shorter, but just more. You know, like I'm reading his blog here. Time and... in King's Landing. 
No, I'm reading his blog here, and it's it's it is the rogues are coming, and uh, he says that, and he says George is writing everybody loves a rogue, brackets introduction because in every anthology yeah, he writes. Yeah, he, he was originally doing that, and then he was he decided it was he was gonna add a short story to it or whatever. Yeah, go down to the end of the post. It I says, think, oh, yeah, "Okay, so... okay, we've decided to add a twenty-first. Yeah, okay. He's tricky sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm actually very much looking forward to that one because, of course, that story should be good. And there's a lot of actually other stories and authors I'm interested in reading in that, surprisingly. So uh, yeah, that comes actually, out in June. I can't too. wait to read yeah. that. Awesome. Anything else anyone wants to mention before we sign off? Um, well, mm. not that you're going to have this ready by soon, but there's going to be a New York meetup, right? Yeah, it's Wednesday. Yes. Oh, Wednesday. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, I think I'm going to be there. Bina's going to be there. Michal... Uh, Lord Prism. I don't know if anyone else is making it, but it should be fun. Man, Vic, we got to get something going on the west side of this country. I know, right? Yeah, yeah, we should. <laughs> <laughs> you live in Portland, right? Uh, no, I live in uh, Colorado, but I, I can get to California yeah, without yeah. too much trouble. Yeah, we could probably pick a common spot or something and uh, assemble there. <laughs> yeah. You guys can go to Vegas. <laughs> I know, I was thinking something yeah. along the same lines. It's closed one flight away. Yeah. Yeah. I'll never get to come to one of these. Uh, <laughs> well, you have Saad. Actually, where does Saad live? Oh, yeah, Saad is in Lahore. Yeah. Lahore, that's, Lahore, in Lahore. Okay. that's in North, right? Yeah. So you are I'm in Saad. Lahore. Oh, you are in Lahore. No, I thought you were in. Lahore. Lahore. I live in Lahore. Well, you're, you're I'm from, from Karachi, Karachi, but you live but in Lahore. Oh, there you go. Lahore. I mean, there's no way you know him. It's a huge city, but. What? I, I have a good friend who goes to my school who's from Lahore. Oh, okay. But um, there's no. It's a huge city, so never mind. And as yeah. we discovered, uh, Lahore's capital uh, population is more than Finland. No, that's Karachi. Karachi is huge. <laughs> Lahore is pretty small compared to that. Lahore is pretty small? Huh. No, Lahore is small compared to Karachi. Karachi is huge. Lahore uh, has... Karachi is like compatible to New York. Right, it's a port city, right? So they're always... Lahore has there. over 5 million. See, like that's still bigger than Finland. And also hasn't heard <laughs> it also hasn't been measured since 1998. Um, yeah, we're kind of slow on updating statistics. And Karachi yeah. is 9.4 million and hasn't also hasn't been measured since 1998. Yeah, it's probably much much bigger now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think we have reached with that uh, all that we're. we're yeah, when we start about. opening a Wikipedia and looking at populations, <laughs> I, uh, I think I remember last time. Like, you know. Wow. <laughs> I was trying to explain why Fahrenheit is better than Celsius. Um, which it is, is better than Celsius. <laughs> no! <laughs> All right, no! no I'm starting this again. The gaps, the gaps in between the Celsius degrees are enormous. It's ridiculous. Right. How do you even know what temperature it is? <laughs> well, well, if uh, it's zero and the water is frozen, then it's zero Celsius. I'm saying that the the get that the the hugeness of a single degree of Celsius contains more than the entire range. Of that's why we have decimal points. <laughs> I suppose, but that's just that's just silly. No, it's, Celsius makes sense. Zero is freezing, hundred is boiling, fifty is just hot. No, Celsius doesn't make any sense. Let's all just use Kelvin. Oh yeah, Kelvin, <laughs> Kelvin is the way to go. Absolutely. There you go. Oh, you just add to seventy-three to the Celsius. Right? So it's pretty much the same. Uh, or subtract, you mean? Uh, no. Yeah, subtract. No, I... Zero Kelvin is minus 273 <laughs> Celsius. I'm so lost. No, at minus, <laughs> at minus 273, nothing exists. Everything stops existing. Yeah, Kelvin, zero Kelvin is negative 273. It can't get colder than that. It's That's not possible. That's the coldest point in the universe. Yep. <laughs> well, I feel like I'm <laughs> off track. Yes. Um, yeah, I'll probably edit this bit out, but it's fine. Oh, I mean, it's a short <laughs> podcast anyway, so yeah, yeah, when, it, once it starts getting longer, then you want to be more... Uh, that's true. C- cut out that's the true. tangents and stuff like that. Yeah. All right, so yeah, cool. thank you again, everyone, for joining me for this yeah. podcast on the Hedge Night. Again, looking forward to continuing these and uh, for other Vox shows we'll be doing in the future. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and that is that. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.